Our processional hymn is Amazing Grace, hymn number 565. Please stand. Blessed to be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee, we glorify Thee. We give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty. O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest on the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. 
Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. The epistle reading is from Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you, for as many of you were baptized into Christ have been put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord God. Now it happened that as Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowd say I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. May we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. We now begin the second half of the Christian year. In the Gospel reading today, we heard about the mission of Jesus, and the first half of the Christian year looks at the coming of Christ and his second coming, his birth, the fact that Jesus has come to be the light of the world in the season of Epiphany for the Gentiles. And then we have the season of Lent, looking at what Christ endured for our sake as he went to Jerusalem to die upon the cross. We have Good Friday, Easter, and then the fact of Christ's resurrection changes everything. The pouring out of God the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to God's people in the church. And then we look at the implications in the second half of the, the Christian year of what it means to be a follower of Christ. What it means to take up your cross, as Jesus says, to follow him. And today we have in the epistle reading this passage from Galatians. And we examine in this passage the implications of what it means to be in Christ. What we find in this passage is that being in Christ unites us to God for eternity, unites us with God's family, the church, and unites us with God's people from the past. In Christ means we're united to God and to each other now and always. We are justified by faith in Christ, united to God and united to each other. We don't have many verses in this passage from Galatians, but they're action-packed. So we'll look at them in turn, starting with verse 23. And what we find in this passage is there's a contrast between being under the law and being in Christ. Under the law being the before and being in Christ being now and after. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Before faith came, we were held captive under the law. And the law in this particular instance means the moral law, summarized in the Ten Commandments given by God. A good law, a perfect law. But, but here's the problem. We have no power within ourselves to keep God's law despite our best efforts to be good and to do everything properly, there's a part of us that will always fail because of our indwelling problem with sin. Just take one, for instance, 
The Tenth Commandment, don't envy. Well, what do we do? We envy all the time. And our violation of one part of the law means we violated all of it. And we're held captive, imprisoned by the law because we are guilty, deserving to be punished. And there is no way out until Jesus opens the way out of prison. Until the coming faith would be revealed. Christ has done this to free us from the imprisonment of the law. Help came when Christ came to set us free. Verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The law was our guardian, and there's several translations for this word in Greek. The word is pedagogos. Sometimes it's translated as school teacher. That's not quite the whole picture uh, here. A, a pedagogos was more than just a teacher who instructed students in math and philosophy. The pedagogos was a person who acted to train a, a young boy, and it was always a boy in the Greek and Roman world, was to train a boy in how to live. What to do and what not to do. And a pedagogos was often uh, depicted uh, as having a spear, not a spear, a rod uh, or a stick to instruct. And so what Paul is getting at is that, that the law was able to instruct us by showing us what's right and what's wrong. And the fact is, is that it acted as a disciplinarian to show us what's wrong. And one effect of being under the law is to reveal people's sinfulness and need for a savior. Reformers in the Reformation said that what the law does because we see how inadequate we are and how we cannot fulfill it, is that the law drives us to Christ. It drives us to the need for a Savior. Because the law can't bestow salvation, but it can convince men and women of the need for it. We need salvation. The law identifies that. The law was our guardian until Christ came, our disciplinarian, in order that we might be justified by faith. We were at once under the law, condemned by the law, and then Christ came, and we are justified by faith. This is the heart of the letters to Galatians, it's also the heart of biblical faith. It was rediscovered by Martin Luther in the Reformation. Why is it so important? Because of this. Because it's an understanding that we don't save ourselves. We are saved by the mercy and grace and love of Jesus Justified by faith means being counted righteous or declared righteous by God. If people were sinless and perfectly obeyed all of God's perfect moral standards, they could be justified or declared righteous on the basis of their own merits. But Paul and the witness of Scripture is that that is impossible for anyone to do. You think, well, that's easy peasy, lemon squeezy, makes sense, right? But there was a problem that we don't have explained to us fully because we're jumping into Galatians in chapter 3. But there's a backdrop to why Paul is writing this letter to this uh, group of Christians who lived in modern-day Turkey in, in the area of Galatia and what they were encountering. And, and here was the problem they were encountering. that These people who were culturally Greek, Greek speakers, Greek, you know, ethnically Greek in their philosophical and religious makeup, heard the gospel. 
They heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that as opposed to the phony baloney gods that they were sort of kind of not sure what to do with. Even their poets and philosophers said they're not really real, so who to believe? And yet, when the crunch came, when the chips were down, when things were going south in life, where would they turn? There was no hope in the Greek world culturally beyond the grave. Not really, except for myths and ideas. But there's no certainty of what the meaning of uh, of life after death was all about, but even the meaning of life itself. And then the good news that there is a Savior, there is someone, God, who really does love you and sent his son for you, for your sake, to atone for all the things that you've done wrong, to put you right with God, to, to give you peace with God and peace with other people, that you don't have to live with guilt and frustration and fear controlling your life. Now, by the mercy and grace of God, Christ and his r ruling through love predominates your life. So many people heard that and accepted it and they, were, they thought that is fantastic news and the church began to grow until some folks from headquarters from Jerusalem began to go to Galatia and said, hey, you've heard about Jesus. That's great. We like Jesus too, but you know something? This whole business of being justified by faith in Christ alone, there's more to the story. In fact, there's a lot more. And God really can't accept you or even like you unless you do all of these things just like we do. And we're here to help you. In fact, we're going to be your instructors. Now, never mind what Paul said. Listen to us. And they're known to history as the Judaizers. The, the Judaizers had their agenda, and really another gospel, Paul says, that added merit or their works to be the, the basis of justification. Well, you can see that the, the stark contrast between the, the, the free grace offered by Jesus and proclaimed by Paul and what these Judaizers were saying and what they were about. They were about control and fear and manipulation. And you'd think, well, you know, the Galatians were smart enough. They were wise enough. They just kind of roll their eyes and go, oh, come on. But they didn't. In fact, as Paul points out earlier in Galatians, they'd even pulled over Peter, the apostle Peter. And Barnabas as well. Paul's colleague in ministering and preaching and teaching among the Gentiles. What was going on here? Well, Paul had to have like a showdown, a face-off, because it's hockey season. So there's a face-off between Paul and Peter. And, and Paul had to set Peter right. Wait a minute. We're justified by faith in Christ and not by following all of these ceremonial laws and practices that we inherited from the past. Those things won't save you, but Jesus will. That's, that, that's the backdrop here of justification by faith and why it's so important. It's, in a way, it's a, a rather simple concept, but it grates. It goes against our innate sense that, well, we can make ourselves right with God by doing whatever. And it's been a prevalent trend in church history for 2,000 years. Trying to base your acceptance before God by what you do rather than what Christ has done for you. Something you or I could never do. Justified by faith. In Christ. And this is good news. And Paul had to push back hard against that tendency to locate our justification in what we do rather than what Christ has done. B. 
because things are different now because Christ has come. Verse 25, now that faith or Christ has come, interchangeable terms here, we are no longer under a disciplinarian. We're no longer under this guardian of the law. We're no longer condemned and imprisoned by the law. Christ has set us free from the demands of the law by meeting them in himself on the cross, taking our punishment in our place. So we are set free, as Paul says in Romans 8, 1, from condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For in Christ, you are all sons of God through faith, united to him by faith, accepted by God for Jesus' sake, in spite of of the fact that at one time we were lawbreakers. Sons and daughters of God through faith. The idea of sons here is a, a common phrase and, and concept, I should say, um, used by Paul in his letters. The idea of, of sonship and what that means and being a son. Under Roman law, it meant that you were a inheritor of the father's estate. Being a son. Adopted into the family as many people were. It was a practice in, in, in Roman culture to adopt. adopt uh, for example, Augustus Caesar became the emperor who was adopted into Julius Caesar's family. It was common. And once you're in, like, Caesar's family, you inherit all of Caesar's position and his wealth and his reputation. Well, even more so by being an inheritor as a son or daughter of God. We inherit all of the blessing. All of the promises, we are heirs to all of it because what Jesus has done. It isn't just by virtue of being born that we're a son or daughter of God. It is specifically in the New Testament emphasized that we are sons and daughters through faith in Christ. That's the connection point. We're inheritors and adopted into God's family because of faith. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So what Paul is saying, there's more than just having the inheritance of a son or daughter being adopted into God's family. We've been baptized. We've gone down into the, the death of dying to the law, sin itself, and come out of the water of baptism as members of God's new creation. Well, that's good. And, and there's another aspect of what it means to be in Christ, that we have put on Christ. It's a familiar motif, a strand in Paul's thinking to, to take off old clothing, the old clothing of the old life, and put on new clothing, put on the new life of Christ, making a deliberate action to live in accordance with all that Christ has done for us. And so we are putting on Christ, putting on new clothing, clean clothing, united to Christ. Then Paul goes on to say in verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What these Judaizers are saying, look, you know, having this Jewish heritage is awesome. It's amazing. And really, you, you know, you Greek people, you need to be more like us. In fact, you've got to be like, completely like us in all aspects. You've got to live exactly like us, because that's the one way to live. And Paul's saying, no way. That's false. That's a lie. That there's one ethnic group is here and then others at the bottom. That, that's false. It's always been false. It's always been a lie. 
There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus has created a completely new humanity. This new humanity transcends all ethnic divisions that separate people. All customs and prejudices are transcended by what Jesus has done. That we are all one in Christ Jesus, part of God's new society, the church. And you ever notice that when you travel around? You can go into a church anywhere and, and it's like family, it's like home. It's the same here in the United States. It's, it's even the same in a foreign country like Canada. It's the same in Europe. If you go to church there, people welcome you because we're members of the same family. Language skills may be not the best uh, in, in foreign lands, but we're welcome because there's an understanding. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is all because of what Jesus has done, because we are in Christ. And then Paul concludes by in these words in verse 29, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. It's kind of a rhetorical question, isn't it? Yeah, well, we, yes, since we are Christ, you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And this is an amazing claim. Again, saying that it, it isn't a natural descent that's important to be Abraham's offspring. It's spiritual descent. It's, it's by faith. It's not genetics. As the Judaizers were claiming, hey, look at our fantastic lineage. Look at Tracer, blah, 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 and all this stuff. And, and Paul's going, no, that's not the important thing here. Abraham is the spiritual father of those who accept God by faith. And that's what Abraham did. He was given this amazing promise by God that his descendants would be as numerous as, as Stars in the sky, sand on the seashore, and Abraham said, yeah, you're God, I believe it. He was justified by faith, accepted by God because of his trust in God. Now, if you are a Galatian listening to this, and you're thinking about being Abraham's offspring... Well, that was 2,000 years ago. That's a long time ago, right? 2,000 years? But for us, it's 4,000 years. That's a long time ago. And the characteristic of God's people then and now has always been faith in God, love of God, trust in God. And it's through our faith in Christ we are the spiritual heirs of Abraham and heirs of the promise made to him. And we're heirs to the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 22 when God says, In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And the blessing of all these nations continues to go forth as more and more people groups even now are being added to God's family by faith in Christ. More and more are counted as Abraham's offspring because we are all in Jesus. Being in Christ means we belong. Being in Christ means we find our place in eternity. We are justified, right related to God as sons and daughters, related to each other in the church, God's new society, as brothers and sisters in the same family. And being in Christ means we're related in history to the succession of God's people. We're Abraham's offspring. And we're made members of God's family by grace. His amazing grace for us. And this response that God looks for from us is faith in what Christ has done. And it's through him we are free. We are no longer under the law. We have a new life, free conscience and free heart to live before God and everyone else in Christ because we are justified by faith. The second half of the Christian year examines the implication of what it means to be in Christ. Being in Christ unites us to God for eternity. 
unites us with God's family, the church, and unites us with God's people from the past. As the Apostle Paul makes clear, we are in Christ because we have been justified by faith in Christ, united to God and united to each other. We are no longer under the condemnation of the law. By faith, we are in Christ with all of its inheritance as sons and daughters of God. There have always been voices, these Judaizers and others throughout church history, that have tried to, to focus, to shift the focus, I should say, to shift the focus away from justification by faith, which is clearly taught in Scripture. And I think they, they shy away from it because it, and on one hand it seems too easy, but on the other hand it kind of puts people like yours truly out of business and saying this is what you really have to do. You know, leaders in the church, well, this is really how you have to live. This is exactly what the, the precepts you have to follow because if you don't, eh, God doesn't really like you that much. And I'm going to make sure that you do things the way I think should be done. And that's what the Judaizers said. That's what others have said in church history. And they've always been wrong. They insist that merit is the way to be acceptable to God, our merit. But the message of Galatians, the message of God, the message of the Apostle Paul, and the message rediscovered by Martin Luther, and Martin Luther loved Galatians, he loved Galatians, is that you are made righteous before God by faith in Christ and what Christ has done for you. And with that faith in Christ, an entirely new life opens before us. A life not lived under compulsion and guilt, but one that is free because of all that Christ has done for us and given us. As Martin Luther says, through faith we belong to Christ and Christ to us forever. Amen. Please stand for the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. For us, for our salvation came down from him and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in thy mercy, we beseech thee also so to lead the nations of the world into the way of righteousness, and so to direct and dispose the hearts of all our leaders 
especially Joe Biden, our president, and Michelle Lujan Grisham, our governor, that thy people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may truly and impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Lord, in thy mercy. Give grace, O heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to thy servants, Foley, our archbishop, Stephen, our bishop, Pete, our priest, and Bill, our deacon, that they may both, by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in thy mercy. Prosper, we pray thee, all those who proclaim the gospel of thy kingdom among the nations and strengthen us to fulfill thy great commission, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all thou hast commanded. Lord, in thy mercy. We give thanks for our missionaries, especially Faith Comes by Hearing, an organization that records and provides audio Bibles in over 1,300 languages, and Cairo's Prison Ministry, a lay-led interdenominational Christian ministry in which men and women volunteers bring Christ's love and forgiveness to prisoners and their families. Guide them, O Lord, and give them boldness to serve thee. Lord, in thy mercy. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who, in this transitory life, are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Kelly, Malcolm, Paula, Bill, Dee, Lena, Mickey, and others we now name before thee. Lord, in thy mercy, we remember before thee, Lord, all thy servants who have departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Courtney Plager and Sophie Galavanian, that they, thy will for them may be fulfilled, and we beseech thee to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy. O God, our Heavenly Father, by thy Son, Jesus Christ, thou hast promised to those who seek thy kingdom and its righteousness all things necessary to sustain their life. We praise and thank you for the recent rains you have given us in our time of need. Please continue sending us moderate rain and showers that we may receive the fruits of the earth to our comfort and to thy honor and glory. Lord, in thy mercy. Grant these our prayers, O Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith, and make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling as able. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, 
we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him? Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. And happy Father's Day. You know, I, I was thinking, you no, know, I, I recently um, had a, a son-in-law added to the family, and I, I, I'm wondering, I mean, I'm just asking fathers out there, is it proper etiquette to expect something from the, the new son-in-law? Always. Oh, always. Okay, yes. All right, yes. Good. All right, well, I'll, I'll just take that uh, under advisement, and I, I may be able to play that card down the road, so thank you. So uh, for Father's Day, uh, we're having a breakfast after this service. So please join us for that. Also a discovery class for newcomers at 930 in the fellowship room. A bunch of other announcements on page 17 for you to have a look at. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and are bound in duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, when the first day of the week overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the hut. All glory be to thee, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, for that thou thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby as one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and of thine almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he given thanks, he brake it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make you before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion, precious death, his mighty resurrection, glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same, and looking for his coming again in power and great glory. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee that, to grant that by the merits and death of thy son Jesus Christ and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in him, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father, Almighty, world without end, And now, as the Savior Christ taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take up your cross, the Savior said.
Let us pray. Almighty and living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost for safe to feed us. We have received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost to share us thereby of Thy favor and goodness towards us, that we are very members and corporate the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory a world without end. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Our recessional is a worship the King. <laughs> 